Hello, and welcome to today's Gem Fields call on the proposed acquisition of Fabergé. Throughout the call, all participants will be in listen-only mode, and afterwards there will be a question and answer session. And just to remind you, this conference call is being recorded. Today, I'm pleased to present Ian Hairbottle, Chief Executive Officer, and Dev Shetty, Chief Operating Officer. Please begin your call, gentlemen. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Good morning, everybody. Um, just want to thank you all for joining this call um, so early in the morning. I know you're all very busy, um, but uh, I'm very excited about to present to you what I, we believe this uh, potential acquisition of Fabergé. Certainly, something that we believe to be potentially transformational for for Gemfield as a company, and in line with our commitment to date of transforming the colour gemstone industry. Um, up until now, anyway, we have been an unusually mining company in that we focus on uh, luxury mining, or well, our focus has been on the mine and the mine, and we believe this potential acquisition to be very much in line with that. Uh, nothing new, just uh, opportunity to accelerate what we're already doing. Um, just the format for the call, I'll go through the presentation very briefly. I'll certainly try not to spend too much time on that. The presentation is available on our website, but I do believe you've all got copies with that. And when we finish, I'll hand you over for uh, questions and, and answers. And I believe most of you dialing in, that's probably the most important part. If I can then just take the disclaimer as read, if we can go straight to page three um, of the presentation. Um, I'm not going to go for it word for word, but I think the key points are highlighted there in terms of, of what the uh, proposed acquisition is and what it means to Gemfields as, as a company. We have the opportunity to acquire what is certainly, uh, I believe, a, a brand with exceptional heritage and many people would recognize it as, as potentially the ultimate luxury brand of all time. Um, having been a, a brand that has provided jewellery to kings and queens, princes and czars and, and leaders of the world over many, many years. Uh, what this does for, for Gemfield is create the opportunity to become the world's leading colour gemstone champion. Uh, we certainly up until now have been the leading colour gemstone mining company and we have focused on generic mining, but by associating with a brand like Fabergé allows us to control the positioning of our product and I do believe this is one of those opportunities where one plus one equals four, certainly more than two, uh, because there's definite clear synergies between the two. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, Gemfields creates an opportunity to accelerate Fabergé's growth by underpinning that brand with access uh, to guaranteed ethics and provenant uh, gemstones, um, which, as you can see, is more and more important where a number of leading retailers are tying into guaranteed diamond supply. We will be able to provide guaranteed emeralds, rubies, amethyst, and hopefully soon a whole lot of others. By the same time, we're talking what uh, Fabergé does, it allows us the opportunity to uh, have some influence over how our product is positioned and certainly increase the aspirational um, uh, positioning of our product having an impact on the pricing across the production range and immediate impact on bottom line for gem fields. Also, uh, as I believe many of you know, our vision has been to move to the main board and I do think we now have a platform that allows it and as a result tied into the deal is the unbundling of rocks. Rocks currently own 63% of gem fields and it's managed by Pallinghurst and part and parcel of the deal will be the unbundling of rocks where after the deal has gone through our single largest shareholder will be Pallinghurst with 48% um, of the company and a commitment from them to uh, sell some of the historic stock as and when required in the interest of the business and you should be able to bring in the right shareholders, specifically luxury goods shareholders. Now, if we just go to page four, I briefly want to go through page four. I believe most of you have heard you know, our story about it and you understand our vision for the colored gemstone sector. It's a sector that's been it's historically recognized but largely overlooked, very fragmented, very layered, undercapitalized, and that's affected its growth. Through the history of mankind, uh, the, the past 6,000 years, colored stones has played a very important part. But for the last 50, it's been largely forgotten. Now, if you look at the bottom of that page, that slide gives a clear example that colored gems, even today, have potential to compete next to diamonds. And there you've got your rubies, emeralds, your amethysts selling at very competitive prices. What's important to see there, though, is that Burmese ruby, uh, cashmere sapphire, and Colombian emerald, effectively, each one of those gems have got an inherent brand, a brand that has come along with them because of history. Gemfields mines Zambian amethysts, Zambian emeralds, Mozambican rubies, hopefully soon Madagascan sapphires and other 
same quality product, um, same positioning, same legacy, same heritage, but a much newer brand. And by being able to associate this fantastic product of ours with the history of the, the um, Fabergé brand, we will be able to accelerate um, the positioning of our product and the achievable prices having a massive impact on the business, I believe. If you look at page five, um, for, forgive us, but this is just five minutes of boasting and patting our own back, but I certainly believe that over the last few years we've done a sterling job with uh, a Gemfield, and there's some fitting analogies. When Dev and I took over leadership of Gemfield, uh, more than 160 million had been put into the business to acquire the car gem mine, clean up the mine, get it right, uh, create a product range, et cetera, and get it on a platform for growth. Uh, at that stage, there'd been zero sales, and I think we had about nine million in the bank. And we've, during that period of time, we've been able to reduce costs, more than double our output, and have a tenfold increase in achievable prices. Undoubtedly, going forward, our commitment will continue to be on the mining of colored gems, increasing our output from our existing product uh, properties, and hopefully bringing on a few more exciting ones in the next year or so. Um, but while that's all important, what's also vitally important is the impact we've managed to achieve on achievable prices. Um, and I think that's you know, going to make a massive difference bringing the Fabergé brand along. So just if you see those synergies, here we are, we get the brand of Fabergé that's being cleaned up, money's been invested and set for growth, so there's an obvious you know, link to what we've done. We believe we did a great job with Gemfields and will continue to do so, so we certainly believe we can do the same with Fabergé. Now, if you turn to page six, that just gives you a very brief background on Fabergé. I won't spend too much time, but it was established in 1842. Today, if one surveys the marketplace, it's still recognized by the vast majority of, of uh, consumers as potentially the greatest luxury uh, brand of all time, um, just because of its heritage and its legacy. And it was sold to Unilever for about 1.5 billion in 1989. Uh, Unilever then created various licenses and they put the brand onto spectacles, neckties, um, collectible champagne, perfumes, etc., etc. And eventually the brand, even Barbie doll, and eventually the brand just died and it, it was put in a, on a shelf. Pallingers uh, bought the, the brand back from Unilever in uh, 2007 for $38 million. Um, but at that stage, you know, the brand was largely forgotten and was very cluttered. They then spent most of the past uh, four odd years cleaning it up, taking most of those other products off the market, getting rid of the old licensing agreement, creating over 100 um, trademarks and intellectual property, etc., and uh, repositioning the brand for growth. And that's where, where we, we come in today. Um, if you then turn to page eight, um, page eight just brings together what you know the key synergistic points: heritage, product, and marketing. Heritage is easy. Fabergé has got a recognized heritage and legacy as a premium luxury brand. Uh, Gemfields has a recognized heritage with ethically sourced, guaranteed provenance, uh, a transparent route to market, emeralds, amethyst, rubies, and soon other products. When you bring the two together, our, the provenance of our stones underpins Fabergé's heritage, and when you add Fabergé to our product, increases its positioning and brand recognition in the eyes of consumers. In terms of marketing, natural synergies, this coming year we'll be planning to spend between four and six million dollars. Um, well, I think I've mentioned before that we're looking to bring an A-list Hollywood starlet to be the face of Gemfield ethical product. That will continue, but a portion of that will now go towards marketing, the, the, what I like to call the Intel inside component. Um, Intel is, is the, the, the actual chip, which is used in a number of uh, computer brands, and they're very proud to say they're using the Intel processor. From our point of view, what will be a Fabergé, it's a recognized brand, but its positioning will be very proud to say Gemfield inside, Gemfield ethical, Zambian emeralds, Gemfield ethical Mozambican rubies, and so on. But over and above that, you know, a lot of the work that is done is overlapping, and we believe we can save and achieve economies there. And then from a product point of view, that's an easy one. Um, we already have access to guaranteed supply of these products. We sell, we mine the rough, we sell the rough, we will continue to sell the rough to our existing auction attendees. They will cut and polish. They are, as we stand at the moment, providing us with um, higher quality stones on consignment, which we are then placing at high-end luxury retail outlets across the world. One of the places we'll place these now will be Fabergé. So it, what the Fabergé does is give us an outlet where we can place our product and have influence over how they that product is positioned in the mind of the consumer, but from a, it also allows where we can place a lot of that product on consignment, 
with uh, Fabergé, so it'll help Fabergé's cash flow and help in the transformation of the business. I then just want to go onto page 10, and you know there you'll see the market sectors. While we we growing and doing very well within the coloured gemstone sector, the coloured gemstone sector at, at rough is estimated to be about two billion dollars. The global hard luxury sector is about 54 billion dollars. So this definitely provides an opportunity for gems to operate in a much bigger global platform with much bigger growth potential. And while we are still will certainly be a small company, we have a very dominant position in terms of our ability to have guaranteed access to this large range of, of gemstones. In terms of uh, the Fabergé brand to date, um, Pallinghurst and its partners uh, have invested more than $160 million into cleaning up the brand. And uh, just in short, to give you a little how we, we didn't pay 160 we will be you're paying in shares, but we've estimated the value of the brand at about $140 million. And how we came to that number is that we said the brand value is approximately at the moment we believe to be $50 million. We got a number of experts involved in terms of the valuation. Not easy when it comes to branding, but we had obviously Can Accord, JPMC, and others. And uh, at the end of the day, the, brand, the value of the brand was estimated somewhere between the um, 140 and 200 million. We're certainly at the low end, but internally we worked the value of the brand at 50 million, working that Pallinghurst paid 38 million not long ago and have spent a lot of time cleaning it up and repositioning and advertising the brand. And certainly global brand recognition has more than doubled in the last few years. There are various um, uh, search engines that can give you that information. Uh, and then on top of that, there's 50 million in stock in the company at the moment at wholesale prices. So obviously that will still be sold at a retail margin. And the business will come without any debt and at least 10 million in cash, which Dev and I believe from what we've done that we work today should see us through about 18 months of operations. Um, and then the final 30 million that's outstanding in that uh, equation, the breakdown of the 140, we believe you know it goes into uh, 10 million of that went into cleaning up the brand, getting rid of all the old um, licensing agreements, uh, probably 10 million into creating. Um, your intellectual capital, et cetera, et cetera, and other work that was done, and then about $10 million into fixed assets, computers, desks, stores, and so on and so on. Um, slide 11 just gives you a quick indication of the peer operating matrix, so just something you hopefully you'll find useful. You'll see you know, various luxury, global luxury brands in terms of the number of stalls, the retail sales per store, the gross achievable margin, and you know, uh, retail sales as a percentage of turnover. Um, we believe there's potential to open two stores a year for the foreseeable future, but our focus in the short term is certainly not going to be on just opening stores. Uh, it, a different case of less is more, and it's more important is quality than quantity. So for the foreseeable future, we'll work on turning, uh, in strengthening the platform and positioning of the existing stores, uh, but there definitely is potential to open up to about approximately 70 within the next 20 years. Um, that sounds like a lot of stores, but if you look at most of the others, that sits somewhere between Growth and uh, Tiffany. In terms of retail sales, our target would be around 7 million per store, and that's definitely very achievable. Uh, their growth is achieving over 20, so um, you know there's definite opportunity, but we've been conservative as always. And operating margin, we believe, will achieve between 45 and 55 percent operating margin. Once again, well within the middle of, of the peers. Um, something that we can do. Slide 12 just gives you a very quick uh, indication. As I said, there's various search engines. This is a simple one that you guys can do yourself, and it shows you two things. In terms of Google Trends, uh, definitely the Fabergé brand is seen to be largely equal to Harry Winston, a brand that just recently there was talk in the media that it may be worth $700 million. And then the other part of that slide shows you that, uh, you know, in, in terms of what they call the IQ component of branding, Fabergé's positioning in the world has increased significantly over the last few years and is currently seen to be valued above um, companies such as uh, De Beers and um, uh, uh, Dunhill and, and so on and so on. Slide 13, I think we all know, we've all seen it, is the hard luxury sector is a sector that's continuing to grow, growing at very rapid rates. And while some of your luxury uh, markets, more the softer luxury, the fashion, have had some negative uh, impact over the last while, your hard luxury, your jewelry, and especially your high-end luxury, this luxury selling to the 1% of the 1%, demand continues to grow and is expected to continue so for the foreseeable future. 
Um, I'll then hand over to Dev quickly, and Dev can just talk you quickly through slides 14 and 15. Although, uh, if you don't mind, I'll come back to those. Uh, what I just wanted to go is to slide 16, and then we'll come back. Slide 16 gives a quick indication of how you know the Rocks Group, which is currently <clears throat> your 63% of, of gem fields, will unbundle, and post unbundling, uh, Pellinghurst will have uh, approximately 49%. Uh, and then uh, uh, EMG or NGPMR will have 13 and Investec 12. Uh, so that's done bundling. But then just back to Dev, who can run you through slides 14 and 15. Thanks, Ian. Uh, in slide 14, what we have uh, tried to say is, is, is the upside valuation potential that uh, Gemfields could have by uh, by uh, terming itself as a, as a luxury ca company. But before before I go to that, I would like to quickly run through the numbers what uh, Fabriges has achieved uh, in the last financial year and for the last six months, which is there in the slide 31. Uh, in slide 31, if you go, you can see uh, Fabriges in, in the financial year 2012 have uh, had a revenue of $6.9 million uh, with, a, with a net loss of $14 million. For six months, 2012, Fabrije had a $2.5 million of revenue with a, with a net loss of $7.2 million. Now, in, in this uh, six months, 2012, I would like to emphasize specifically that uh, Fabrije has managed to achieve a gross profit margin level of 40%. And, and, and in, the, in the medium term, what, what Genfish by itself would be targeting is, is to achieve a, a gross profit margin of 45 to 50%. Now, the six-month number revenue looks very low. Uh, for, the, for the reason is most of the revenue starts coming in from, sub, from October uh, onwards, uh, nearing the Christmas and, and thereon. Uh, as we speak, as on date, Fabrizia has already touched $8 million in revenue uh, uh, with, a, with a gross margin of, of more than 40%. Now, in terms of the operating cost, uh, the operating cost is, is approximately $15 million. Um, the operating cost mainly covers uh, an operating cost for all the stores right now that they have got. As Ian mentioned previously that Fabrije has got five uh, outlets of which three are stores and two are uh, concessions. Uh, out of these five outlets, four have, have been recently opened. Uh, they opened in last 18 months, of which two have just opened in, in 2012. And, and because of that, I think, I think the revenue have just started kicking in uh, in the financial year 2012-2013. Uh, if you come back to the slide 14, is, is where uh, we are saying Gemfil is, is, is in the green bracket of, of, of the PE multiple, and we, we, we see a potential of, of taking us uh, uh, to the, to the, to the gray, gray level to the uh, SSA luxury minus uh, in terms of a PE multiple. Now, in terms of break even point, uh, what, what, we are, what we are thinking uh, is when Fabrije can break even, and that, that based on the numbers that we have been presented, and, and I'm sure there will be a lot of synergy impact that as we go along and, and Gemfields get, gets uh, management control post-completion. But as, as, as we stand, Fabrije will break even in 2015-2016 financial year uh, with the with operating spending of 15 to $16 million and, and a revenue of, of, of around $30 million. Slide 15 is basically the deal. Uh, in terms of what the deal constitutes, it's uh, 214 million shares for 100% of Fabrije. Uh, it's a all all shares deals. There is there is no cash uh, involved. Uh, it 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 means the enlarged company, uh, the Fabrije shareholders will have in the enlarged company approximately 39.6%. Uh, at the 30 days VWAP, uh, it's, it's it's valued at around 142 million dollars. Uh, it's Fabrije will be a debt-free company. It will come with a minimum $10 million uh, as a cash and, um, and, and an inventory at a wholesale value of $50 million and, and the acquired cost of the, of the trademark, of, uh, which, is, which is roughly around $38 million in cost and, and the $10 million uh, for the cleaning up process. So all, all adds up to around $50 million for the, for the trademarks. Uh, unbundling is one of the condition precedent for rocks, uh, which uh, a Palingas uh, uh, holding will come down from a Palingas holding by itself will go up from 33 to 48 percent, but the largest single shareholder will come down from 63 to 49 percent, uh, which is a condition precedent, and uh, it needs a whitewash uh, up, uh, circular approval from the minority shareholder, and it will be tabled in the in the general meeting in December. Super. Okay, thank you. So just to summarize, um, Gemfields will continue to focus on increasing its emerald output, bringing our rubies onto stream, marketing and, and promoting our amethyst. We also look to bring other colored stone deposits online. 
um, and marketing coloured stones. But what Fabergé does is create an opportunity for us on a long-term sustainable basis to be, to some extent, masters of our own destiny and have a stronger influence over the continuous and sustainable positioning of coloured stones, uh, preventing them from being accessible to the whims of, of fashion designers. In other words, what we don't want is this month or this season's colour to be green and next red. Um, diamonds have done a sterling job of going beyond that, and we believe colour has the opportunity to do the same and to be perceived uh, from a value perspective on par with diamonds, and this is part of our, the process of getting there. So um, thank you once again, and handing over to you guys. Any questions? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a question, could you please press zero one on your phone keypad now? And if you wish to retract that question, you can do so by pressing zero two to cancel. And there'll be a brief pause while questions are being registered. Just to remind all participants that if you wish to ask a question, please press zero 01 on your keypad now and press zero 02 to cancel. And there'll be a further pause while questions are being registered. Once again, if you have a question, please press zero 01 on your telephone keypad. As there seem to be no questions at this stage, actually there is one that's just jumped in, and we'll go over to Brenton Cordera of Reuters. Please go ahead with your question. Your line is now open. Brenton, if you want to take your phone off mute. Sorry, uh, phone is on mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, uh, Ian, uh, if it's okay for me to pose a couple of questions to you on this call? Yes, sure. With pleasure. Okay. Okay, um, I'm just wondering what the role of the uh, Fabergé family would be at this, uh, in, through this transaction in yeah. terms of the Heritage Council. <coughs> Certainly. That's the, the Fabergé family, you know, when um, Unilever took over the brand, the, the brand itself was separated from, from the Fabergé family. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Palinghurst, or what is currently the Fabergé Limited, took back control of the brand, they reunited the brand. Um, with the family, and we believe that's important. Um, you know, to have a heritage such as this one, which is very much tied into you know, an individual and his family is very key. Um, and the Heritage Council, there's uh, uh, Tatiana Fabergé um, and her cousin involved, and they are very much involved in the heritage. And basically what that does is they oversee both the history um, we're working very hard to, to create various museums tracking the history of the brand, both from a positive and a negative, uh, keeping examples of all the diluted products uh, under Unilever and all the historic products uh, under the Fabergé family. And they, they then create creative guidance to the creative director, Katerina Floor, uh, in terms of what they see is, you know, they have a family and the legacy coming through. So they've, they're very active. Um, they're not in terms of a management point of view, but, you know, probably the best way to say it in terms of in a board the chairman chairman comes in yeah. and he positions the company in terms of what is right um, but they're also a younger generation looking for some level of past and some level of transformation and refreshing so uh, they're very active and it's great to be working with them so they would uh, the council would still exist and would still play a role in advising uh, on style and the brand heritage and such right certainly certainly okay uh, yeah Sorry, and my second question would be, uh, okay, I'm a little bit confused as to um, uh, the details of the transaction here. It, considering Palinghurst owns a, a very large stake in both the companies, um, how exactly is, I mean, who's selling to whom, basically? I mean, how does this work? Well, is it sort of a transfer of assets? No, it's very much Gemfield that is acquiring it from uh, uh, from Fabergé. We're acquiring Fabergé, and you have a single shareholder in both, but we operate. In other words, Gemfield is a public listed company. We're yes. listed on the board. We've got a number of independent directors, and the uh, dependent directors, which were Sean Gilbertson, excluded himself from this deal. So he wasn't involved at all, and so it was the independent directors of Gemfield that reviewed. We got our bankers and others to give us a valuation, and we then put forward the offer to Palinger's Limited, Palinger's Limited, uh, sorry, to Fabergé Limited, and yeah. Fabergé Limited has a various shareholders which themselves, their board, put it to them and they considered, 
And of course, you know, once that was considered, your Pallingers, who, which is a listed company as well yeah. um, in South Africa, its shareholders had to have a view of it. So it was it was a very formal process. And even you know, it's like you can have we, the way Gemfields runs is we respect all of our shareholders. We respect the minorities, we respect the majorities, and we our, our focus is on running the business. And it's exactly the case. And just for interest's sake. Prior to finalizing the deal, we did go to some of our independents and we had various discussions with them to get their view, to make sure that they were supportive. And the response was overwhelmingly supportive. And in one, in fact, I'll just give you one quote, quick quote there, is one of the shareholders said, Ian, this is fantastic. It's a bit like a, one of the smaller car manufacturers acquiring Mercedes-Benz. So, you know, it, it's just how they, they see the value and the potential going forward. Um. As per the Pallinghurst website, they own about 88%, I think, of Fabergé. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so um, effectively, Gemfields is uh, buying Fabergé from Pallinghurst, right? I yeah, mean, I think uh, uh, I'll put it in the right right manner. I think I think Pallinghurst is a consortium of investors, so it's it's not uh, Pallinghurst per se. So Pallinghurst yeah. have got three investors uh, on the back, so they have got a conduit vehicle. Uh, yeah. So what we basically we are we are paying, and those conduit uh, shareholders are also the shareholder in Gemfields uh, uh, in Rocks Limited. So if you can yeah. understand, so we have a common shareholders in in both entities. Yeah. So so what is happening effectively? Uh, effectively is 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 the holding may go up in totality from 63 to 74 percent between yeah. the between the conduit vehicle. But mm-hmm. what we have agreed in principle and uh, as as a condition precedent is. The the one single shareholder owning and shareholding in Gemfields will will come down from 63 to 40 48 percent, and and what that does is uh, that Ro- that Rocks Limited, which yeah. is the existing shareholder of Gemfields, are going to unbundle uh, and unbundling in a way where where Palingas will have Palingas being a fund is currently managing uh, uh, managing the voting voting rights for for all the three shareholders. But as a, as a package deal of unbundling, uh, all the three shareholders will go separately. The Palingas will have no say on the voting rights for the three shareholders. So, so, so that is the deal uh, that, that we have. Okay. Uh, because, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, because of the nature of ownership uh, for both firms and the nature of the transaction in the sense that it's an all stock transaction, uh, I just, you did say that, I th- did you say, that Sean Gilbertson did not take part in the voting of the deal or something? Uh, of the That's right. Uh, Sean Gilbertson <coughs> is, a, is a director uh, oh, in, yeah, both, comp- in yeah. both the companies. Uh, so he, he declared his interest and, and he didn't he didn't get involved in in the in the in the deal per se in the in terms of negotiation. So the negotiation was taken straight with the Palingas board and and Gemfield board. Okay. And in order, in order for the deal to go through, what kind of uh, percentage of majority would you need on the voting? So basically, the directors per, per se uh, don't need. Uh, directors have got a mandate from shareholders to issue 214 million shares. Uh, yeah. So, so the deal doesn't need uh, an approval from the shareholder. But as I said, the Palingas Resources Limited, one of the shareholders behind the conduit vehicles, effective holding increases from 33% to 49%. Uh, w- what is required as per the uh, rule line, uh, the pa- panel the, the panel has said that there is a whitewashed uh, requirement uh, which needs an approval of more than 50% of the shareholders of of independent shareholders, which is where Palingas can't vote. Okay, uh, I think that makes sense. If I have any further clarifications, I can get through Tavistock. Maybe I reach out to you guys. Sure. Thank you very very much. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Charlie Henderson at Sankos. Please go ahead with your question. Your line is now open. Morning, Ian. Morning, Dev. Morning, um, Morning Charlie. Just a quick question. How, how many color stones are Fabergé currently selling, and what's the revenue they're getting from that? In terms of number, they, they're using all the colors. So, um, you know, definitely your, your premium product, your emeralds, ruby, sapphires. But certainly, at the spinel, amethyst, and so on. So you, you know, they've got a long history of colour, and, and all of the colours are involved. And a large percentage. Dave, what's the percentage at the moment? I think more than 50%. Yeah, I think uh, Charlie, to be precise, I think uh, 35% of their stock is is gemstone, of of which more than 60% is colour. 
um, and and um, and and rest is like 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 diamond. And and going forward, uh, the strategy is is as as we are posi positioning uh, Fabrizio as a color gemstone champion, is to, is to increase the the percentage of gemstone from 35. Uh, say to 60 percent in in near future uh, by 2014 and 15, and thereby increase in uh, in, in the medium term to short term to 75 percent, and and the color of that would con would constitute a large last portion uh, of of that mix. So I'm just trying to work out what percentage you think you can get from your production into the Fabergé stores going forward. So yeah, roughly, if, if you want to want to want us to put a number, uh, it's very difficult to say of our production because, as we explained, uh, we are going to sell all our stock through auction process to the dealer, and we will be either buying back or putting into our consignment uh, to the Fabergé. What we can say is, out of Fabergé's sales or out of their their product portfolio, I think I think we, we their 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 pro procurement would be at least 50% of color gemstone. Coming, coming through us. And just Charlie, on that, in the short term, certainly it'll be a very small percentage of our pro product because you know a small percentage of our production is at the very high end, and of that, only a percentage will go to Fabergé. Uh, a lot of it will continue to go to the other high-end jewelers that we are building relationships with and we, we work extremely well with. So it's not a matter of make, placing our stock through Fabergé. There's a lot of demand for that. It's more about making sure that we sustain the, the positioning of that product at the high end. You know, we've also found places where some of Gemfield's ethical products have ended up in some retailers and they might uh, unknowingly classify it as Colombian. Um, that does, is not good for them and it's not good for us. And as we now get more involved, we'll help the industry, you know, make sure that we use the right branding, et cetera, and, and appreciate the value of doing that. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Once again, if you have a question, please press zero 01 on your keypad now. As there are no further questions, uh, gentlemen, can I please pass the call back to you to close? Yes, certainly. Thank you. So just to finalize, I was thinking afterwards on, on Charlie's question. So really what we're doing is creating an aspirational pull at the highest end for our complete product range, which will benefit all of the this various sectors, whether it's high street, you know, high end jewelry, or the TV channels, etc. Uh, even the internet shopping by creating the aspirational component. Anyway, in short there, thank you guys. Thank you once again for, for coming online. Um, I do hope that all your questions are answered. If not, feel free to get hold of uh, Dev, myself, I, Tavistock, etc. Um, and, and we look forward to moving this forward and continuing the growth and development of, of, of Gemfield and the Coloured Stone sector. We're very excited and we thank you for your support. This now concludes our call. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Now, disconnect your lines.